Choosing a Ryzen 7000 Mini ITX board could just be the most agonizing process if you're building up the latest and greatest AMD system. But here's some info you just might want to know to make that decision a little less painful. Welcome to Machines and More. Motherboard selection is a pain point uh, for getting into a mini ITX AM5 built, and it's due to a combination of limited models thus far, chipset segmentation, and pricing. If you look at the last generation of AM4 boards, we had two chipsets in B550 and X570, and the major brands at that point had quite a few offerings for us to choose from within those chipsets. Now it's early on, uh, between the various B650 and X670 chipset options, there's only five boards and I've reviewed all five boards and today I'm doing a roundup and we'll just discuss a few categories in which boards are best and notable within those categories and at the end I'll have a few recommendations for you. Within B650 and X670 chipsets, there are four further levels of segmentation, starting with B650. For B650, we have two ITX boards, one from MSI and one from Gigabyte. B650E expands on that and offers a PCIe 5.0 expansion slot and M.2. For ITX, there's the ASUS B650EI and the ASRock B650EPG ITX. There isn't a non-EX670 option for mini ITX, but there is an X670E ITX board, and that's the one from ASUS. So with the MSI B650i and the Gigabyte B650i, your expansion slot is Gen 4, while the ASRock and both ASUS boards are Gen 5. By the way, you're welcome to check out those reviews separately, and real quick, if you haven't hit that subscribe button yet, please uh, go ahead and do that. Uh, you're here, and the content here on this channel should hopefully appeal to you, so I really appreciate the help here. So one thing that was consistent across these boards was that the build quality of all the boards, they're all quite decent and all of them had integrated rear IO shields. The Gigabyte perhaps felt a little bit more overbuilt with its plastic back shield. Uh, the ASUS X670E felt solid and heavy, but at the end of the day, they're all comparable and uh, it's gonna be mounted in a case, right? So they just have to be okay. And uh, the function's a lot more important uh, than uh, how, what it feels like, right? So we'll focus on those categories where there are some levels of differentiation. And that first category for me here is IO. All these boards do support Wi-Fi 6E and have 2.5 GE. So what about the differentiators? In terms of pure USB, the ASUS X670E is going to win that just based on the numbers. You've got five high-speed A ports, three 2.0 type A ports, two 40 gigabits per second USB-C ports on the rear. But it's also worth noting that this board needs the auxiliary Hive device for its audio, which on one hand delivers great audio through a high quality external DAC, but outside of that device, you're getting nothing on board. Now, the Hive device also takes up a specific port on the back, but it also gives you a back at 10 gigabits per second USB-C port and a 2.0 port on the device itself. Plus this 2.0 front panel headers are located on the clunky add-on card as are the uh, front panel connections. So judging by the numbers, technically it is the best in terms of the USB, but it is not without some major caveats. Its little brother, the ASUS B650E for me is gonna be the most balanced overall in this category. On the rear, it has four high-speed type A ports, two 2.0 type A ports, a 20 and a 10 gigabits per second type C, and the onboard audio, it's, it's pretty good, with a combo of an ALC 4080 and a Savvy Tech amp. Noteworthy mention in this category is MSI's B650. Now that might seem like a strange pick out of the remaining three boards because in terms of raw USB port count, it's the lowest. But get this, all five of its type A ports are high speed ones. And it also has a 20 gigabits per second rear USB-C port. So while ASRox has that 20 gigabits USB-C rear port and seven type A ports, only three of those are higher speed. And I just think the high speed ports are going to matter more going forward than the raw port count here. One thing to note, the MSI board does have only a Gen 4 expansion slot because of that B650 chipset designation. And both of its M.2s are Gen 4, but I really don't think those things matter too much at this point. And we'll continue on with storage here. For storage, the Gigabyte B650 tops the others because it supports three M.2s. 
And one of those is going to be a Gen 5 compatible one. Uh, they have in their discretion uh, made one of those uh, Gen 5 compatible. And it has two SATA data ports, albeit those SATA ports are on the riser card. And another thing to note is that the third drive on the back port, it's a little bit more difficult to access because you have to get underneath that plastic back plate, but it is there. All the other boards do support two M.2s. Gen 5 support as of right now is only meaningful if you are going with an expensive drive, but the ASUS and ASRock also have Gen 5 compatibility for the top M.2. MSI's two are Gen 4 only, but MSI's board does stand out in that for those of you needing connectivity for HDDs and 2.5 inch SSDs, it has four SATA 6 gigabits per second ports, and that is the most out of any of the boards here since all the other ones only have two ports. Plus, these four ports are directly on the board. This guy doesn't use any riser cards. So if you're a data hoarder, actually the MSI may be more useful in this scenario. Now let's move on to board layout and user experience, which is a very important part of the equation. Whether you're a first time or experienced builder, the small things go a long way to ensuring a good build experience. Minimal cable management difficulties, a few obstructions on and around the board, and easy troubleshooting. Both ASUS boards have a decent layout for headers, uh, but uh, because the X670E needs an add-on card for the full front panel connectivity, and also it needs the included but separate Hive device for debug LEDs, I think the inconveniences of needing those two extra devices uh, does disqualify it somewhat in that regard. The ASUS B650E ITX though has an excellent layout and it has fan LED headers easily accessible along the top of the board. It has an onboard debug LED, which is helpful in general for DIY PC, but really, really especially helpful for Ryzen 7000 due to the longer memory training times. It has a low M.2 heatsink, which helps with air cooler compatibility. And ASUS's BIOS is comparatively and generally user friendly, and it's roughly 15 second post times are fairly reasonable. I know, that's just how uh, Ryzen 7000 is. Uh, one shortcoming in this area, however, is that it doesn't have a clear CMOS button and that the location of the clear CMOS header may be obstructed by cabling when the build is complete. The honorable mention board in this category is the MSI, which doesn't necessarily have as optimized a location of the fan and LED headers, but it has a debug LED, and it also has the only clear CMOS button in the entire roundup today. And that button might be a little bit too proud of the back since I have seen a blame for a discharged CMOS battery upon arrival, but I really think that's more on the packaging department for not properly accommodating that button. The board has a low M.2 heatsink. There's no need for add-on cards here, and it gives a generally easy build experience. The fan on the M.2 heatsink is controllable in MSI's BIOS, which is acceptable as far as BIOSes go. Now, this board does have a longer post time at about 23 seconds, but yeah, it's not the end of the world here. So there's one other board I do absolutely have to mention in this category, and that's the Gigabyte, because unfortunately with this one, the layout, it's awful. The location of the key headers are covered by other components, and those headers often require dongles. An add-on card is required for the board to have full functionality, and still a dongle is required for front panel headers. And the M.2 heatsink, it's tall, it's clunky, and the build experience is uh, quite poor. You'll be hunting around looking for things uh, quite a bit. All these boards are capable of running the current crop of Ryzen 7000 CPUs, and PBO with some curve optimizer tweaks will be a really reasonable way to run these CPUs. But if you wanted to manually overclock the CPU, the board that offers the most power delivery is the ASUS X670E, followed closely behind by the ASRock B650E. The ASUS has a 10 plus 2 setup with 110 amp power stages, and the ASRock also has 10 stages for the CPU with a 10 plus 2 plus 1, 105 amp stage setup. One small difference is that the ASUS does have a VRM fan while the ASRock does not, uh, but in my testing, the VRM temps on the ASRock board were very well managed, and I don't think you're missing out on much except noise. Third place here is the Gigabyte with an A plus 2 plus 1 105 amp setup. And the two weakest boards on paper in this lineup are the MSI with an A plus 2 plus 1 80 amp setup 
and the ASUS B650E with a 10 plus 2 70 amp setup. However, all of these boards are very solid setups, and despite there being a clear hierarchy here, I just don't think most users will see a tangible difference. Now, just to put things into perspective, one of the best ITX, well, uh, smaller form factor boards uh, for the AM4 socket was the Mini DTX Crosshair Impact 8. What kind of power setup did that board have? 8 plus 2 70 amp stages. And that would be at the bottom of the stack here, at least on paper. So power delivery wouldn't be my primary concern here. They're all very capable. With memory, I didn't have any issues with RAM OC and the boards tested and the official support is all quite similar. However, the board that gave me the least headache uh, in the process of overclocking RAM was the MSI simply because of the clear CMOS button. So when I went too far, just pressed the button and cleared it out. Finally, the price. The similarity here is that none of these boards are cheap. As of right now, US prices, the B650i is the lowest cost one at 260. MSI, which was cheaper when it was first introduced, is now around 275. ASRock at 290. ASUS B650E at 325. And finally, ASUS's X670E at a whopping $430. Although, even though it doesn't have onboard audio, the included Hive device is also an external DAC and an amp, and it can be quite valuable, but at the same time, you're being made to buy it, right? So with the pricing setting the stage, let me give you my recommendations. So first off, easy pass on the Gigabyte B650i. It has some good features, but a, not a very good board in terms of the layout. Things like no debug LED and the need for an add-on card, dongles makes this one easy out. For the ASUS X670E, I also wouldn't recommend this one for most people. Don't get me wrong, it's a solid board. I've been running one in the A4H2O custom loop, but at a hefty cost, right? And you'll have to deal with the auxiliary components. Um, the value just isn't there for me as it is. As for the ASRock, it's not a bad board either and has a few strong features such as a few two amp fan headers, but it still has a few quirks with the layout and things like the M.2 fan cable and the fan setup are a head scratcher. ASRock's BIOS, well, to, to put it bluntly, it sucks and it doesn't have enough high speed ports at the rear. Just not a strong recommendation here, although the price, it's, it's not too terrible. If you want Gen 5 compatibility for the expansion slot and one M.2, and you're willing to spend a little bit more, the ASUS B650 EITX would be my solid higher end choice. It's got an excellent layout, great IO, solid onboard audio, low M.2 heatsink, and it doesn't rely on any add-on cards and it even has a temp probe header. And in general, I think ASUS didn't make many unforced errors here with the board. There are a few quirks here like the VRM fan and not being able to control it. But I think as a higher end option, this one would be my recommendation at the stack. Now, some users have reported coil wine with board, but I didn't, but you know, that's something to check out because uh, depending on the production date, it's definitely a possibility still. And uh, you know, just once you're up and running, go listen for that if it bothers you. It is priced at $325 US though, and if you're like most folks that are running a 7600 or 7600X, it might not make sense, right? Now, if I had to pick one single board out of the stack that would be my single recommendation for 95% of users out there, it would be this one, the MSI B650i. So sure, it doesn't have any Gen 5 compatibility, but the utility of that is not going to be fully realized for quite some time. Even when those differences start being noticeable, are you gonna be using the highest end components where that can be a factor? What this board does well is tangible right now. The IO, as I mentioned, is not necessarily a home run on paper, but it manages to hit the things that matter. Decent audio features and those extra SATA data ports are a boon as well. The layout and the UX, again, not the flat out greatest, but then again, it's quite good and it doesn't have any glaring issues. It's got that debug LED, the only clear CMOS button here in the stack, and I think the biggest strength of this board is that it is very balanced and manages to touch on the features that will matter to gaming or productivity users alike today while still hitting a mostly okay price. Now, keep in mind when it was first released, it came in at about 230 to 240 US and that would have made this recommendation even easier. And that position being so low relative to the other boards may have prompted a strategy change. Um, I don't know why it ratcheted up, uh, but it's still quite a decent gap between this and the ASUS B650e. And you could easily spend the difference on a better CPU cooler, or get a higher binned RAM kit, and there's lots of ways that you could spend that in a more meaningful way. 
So there you have it. I hope you found that helpful. Please give a like and make sure you're subscribed. I will leave links for all the boards down below. So please check them out. Happy building and thanks for watching.